Well, first of all, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with everyone today and be invited on this event. I will briefly introduce myself. My name is Belle True. I am the Middle East correspondent for The Independent, and I'm speaking to you today uh, from Beirut, which I think is a fairly apt location for today's webinar, which will be taking on quite a huge task of examining the future of the Middle East in 2020 and beyond. Um, there will be questions at the end, and so I will go through, um, we'll first of all hear from all the panelists. Uh, if anyone has any questions, they can um, send them by the chat and um, the organizers of the event will be fielding some of those. So as I said, um, Beirut is, a, is, is a, um, quite an apt location for this conversation. Uh, many of the topics we'll be discussing today um, are actually part of the multi-headed crisis which is unfolding here. Um, as you, many of you know, we're in the grips of an unprecedented financial collapse after decades old corruption. When this all first began um, to crescendo in the autumn, it sparked Lebanon's own revolution, which is still bubbling away today, um, like many other revolutions in other parts of the region. But woven through that, of course, is soaring sectarian tensions here that has quite an important and tricky geopolitical dynamic, no, no least, of course, involving Libya's, uh, Lebanon's neighbours, Syria. The downside of anchoring this from Beirut is that we've had 20 hour power cuts a day and failing generators. So hopefully that will not impact my ability to steer the proceedings today. So I'll just briefly overview, give you an overview of what sort of topics we're gonna to be looking at today. Well, I mean, of course, foreign intervention in the Middle East and North Africa is not new, um, but in my opinion, as someone who was born here and raised here and spent most of my career here, it's become increasingly fraught over the last few years. Um, into an increasingly fraught sort of international theatre of war that is changing pretty quickly. Perhaps one of the most significant changes at the moment um, and what we'll be looking at today is the role of the US, um, which is arguably becoming increasingly contested in places like northern Syria and Iraq, um, as well as the rise of the role of Washington's and London's allies uh, like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, those are playing a sort of front seat role now in some of the biggest and more complex conflicts like uh, Libya and Yemen. Of course, on the background of that is Russia, uh, which is uh, you know, expanding its influence across the region, not just in Syria, but now uh, taking an active role in Libya. And on the other side of that, in many of the conflicts is Turkey, which again has boots on the ground in Northern Syria and Libya as well. Led over that, and what we'll be looking at today is uh, the increasingly tense uh, war of words, maybe we can call it, um, between the US and Iran, and the role that US allies Israel plays in that. But international politics aside, there have been some major events this year which have, of course, shaped the future of the region, like, for example, the coronavirus pandemic, um, and perhaps some more localised issues, which, again, we will be discussing, like the possible, um, Israel's possible annexation of uh, parts of the occupied West Bank, which many say could threaten key Middle East peace agreements um, across the region and possibly the potential for a peace deal between the Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and then, of course, amid that, um, in places like where I am in, in, in Lebanon, we have the emergence of, of serious protest movements, uh, but not just, of course, in Lebanon, Iraq and Iran. It really began to blossom last year and at the moment are challenging sort of the assumed sectarian identities of the region, as well as what protesters say is the decades old political status quo, the corrupt, corrupt old guard. So to steer us through this immensely diverse landscape of topics, we have four speakers today, which I will now introduce. Um, starting out, we have Dr. Simon Mabin. He is the Senior Lecturer in International Relations at Lancashire University, where he's also the Director of the Richardson Institute. Um, he has served as an academic advisor to the House of Lords International Relations Committee inquiry into UK relations into the Middle East, and is the author of, the Saudi, of Saudi Arabia and Iran, power and rivalry in the Middle East. And I'll come back to some of the topics that um, Dr. Maven will be taking us through um, in a bit. That will be followed by Wayne David, a Labour Member of Parliament since 2001, who currently serves as the Shadow Minister for the Middle East and North Africa under Keir Starmer. But he's had many other roles in the past, including, if I'm correct, Shadow Minister of Defence. Um, today he will be speaking about the different trends that he sees in the region and in his role um, and will likely zoom in on some of the um, key topics like Israel's possible annexation of the West Bank as well as the UK's role in the region. Followed by that we'll have Dr May Darwish, a lecturer in international relations of the Middle East at the University of Birmingham. She's the author of Threats and Alliances in the Middle East, Saudi and Syrian Policies in a Turbulent Region 
um, we'll be looking at quite um, hefty um, series of topics, including military interventions in Yemen, Bahrain, and Libya, the civil wars in Syria and Iraq, and increased repression in the region. And then we will close with Dr. Edward Busnage, the lecturer in politics and international studies at the Open University, where he is also the director um, for the international studies program. His monograph, Diplomacy and Reform in Iran, was published in 2016, and he will be focusing on Iran uh, today on the opportunities and challenges facing the country in the coming decade and the possibility of a post US Middle East. Um, before we kick off, I hope you won't mind if I just take a few minutes to pay tribute to an incredible colleague um, who we lo lost last night. I think it would be remiss not to mention um, the death, the tragic killing of Hashem al Hashimi, who is an incredible um, researcher and academic. I'm sure anyone who has studied the Middle East or who's um, working on the Middle East will have worked with him or read his work. Uh, he, in my opinion, he has unparalleled knowledge of the so-called Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and more recently his work um, has been excellent on, on different militia groups, Iran-backed militias. He was a vocal critic of all of these armed groups, um, particularly in his country, Iraq, and that sadly may have cost him his life. Our thoughts are with his family today. His killing not only deprives us of immense wealth of knowledge, but as a stark reminder of the incredibly worrying dynamics in the region and why we need to have conversations like we're having today um, and it also quite raises questions for the UK and those of us in the West about what our role should be or shouldn't be in the region. And so to help answer some of those questions, we will start with Dr. Simon Maben, who will actually begin um, by discussing and reflecting on Iraq uh, as well as Lebanon and the burgeoning crisis of states across the region. So I will hand the metaphorical microphone over to you, uh, Dr. Maben. Um, and I guess ask you what you think the future of the Middle East will be in 2020 and beyond. Um, and just to remind all speakers, you have around 10 minutes to speak um, in, in total. Sure. Thank you. Metaphorical microphone received. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Bell. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. I'm really excited to, to share some thoughts and observations with uh, friends, colleagues and, and all of you out there. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> I think I've got the slightly unenviable task of, of trying to set out some of the domestic issues that are facing the region um, now and indeed moving forwards. Uh, when we started putting this event together, there were a myriad set of issues, often parabolic, uh, intersectional issues that were affecting not only the individual states and communities themselves, but also the region as a whole. And I think that that we can trace many of these issues back um, back decades. These aren't new phenomena that, that states are facing across the Middle East. And indeed, we're, we're rapidly approaching the 10th anniversary of the uh, quote unquote Arab uprisings, the Arab Spring or the Arab revolutions, um, which began in late 2010 when a Tunisian street vendor by the name of Mohammed Bouazizi self-immolated after facing widespread socioeconomic uh, marginalization, frustration, repression at the hands of the Ben Ali regime. And the, the, the anger that emerged following Bouazizi's self-immolation triggered a spate of protests across the region that took many uh, academics, commentators, analysts by surprise. Few expected such authoritarian regimes to be shaken quite the way that they were in, in the likes of Egypt and Syria, to name but two. And I think what that does is it t tells you the extent to which these underlying structural factors were, were so serious and so prevalent across the region. Tensions that were driving these, these protest movements remain. These structural factors that were driving protest movements continue to shape political life in a number of states across the region. And as a consequence, I don't think it's all that surprising that we continue to see protests playing out in Lebanon, in Iraq and, and elsewhere across the region. The Middle East has the highest youth unemployment rates across the world. It also has some of the highest levels of corruption in the world, where it's exacerbated by levels of political corruption, authoritarianism, increasing sectarianism, um, states that are penetrated by geopolitical rivalries, such as the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, although not exclusively that rivalry, and fundamentally, I think there are tensions between rulers and ruled. And that, I would argue, is the biggest crisis that the region is facing. 
this set of tensions between rulers and ruled that will play out in a range of different ways contingent on the peculiarities of time and space. So there's a whole host of existential crises that are taking place and taking hold right now. And I would argue that these existential crises have had a serious impact on states, on political projects, and on, on sovereign power more broadly. The erosion of internal and external dimensions um, that has had a real impact on, on the regulation of life across the region. We see that, that in a number of cases, particularly in, in Lebanon and Iraq, we've seen, we've seen power sharing processes being put in place as a means of moving beyond conflict. But in doing that, we see that, that corruption, um, authoritarian tendencies, communal divisions have been enshrined, have been deepened, making it increasingly difficult to move beyond the, the cementing of communal difference. And, and as, a, as a consequence of that, we see identity politics becoming more and more prevalent in, in a vast number of states. We see questions about economic issues in terms of, of um, unemployment, in terms of access to jobs, in terms of growth, in terms of, of sovereign wealth, in terms of questions about oil, and how states are addressing these questions is having a dramatic impact on, on the regulation of life across the region. And that, of course, has been exacerbated by, by COVID-19, which I'll touch on briefly, but there were questions about political life and the political ordering of life prior to COVID-19, such as the, the protests that, that Bell was alluding to in terms of Lebanon and Iraq. And in terms of Lebanon, we see, we see vast anger and frustration at the extent to which the Lebanese economy has, has all but collapsed in terms of, of economic frustration, political inertia, bureaucratic inertia, rampant corruption. It's the, the third most indebted state in the world and if you look at the, the data on what's happened recently, you'll see that, that the Lebanese pound in the past few months has lost two thirds of its value. You'll see that the most um, Lebanese folks, their salaries have lost 70% of their value. Some employees in state institutions are paid once every two years prior to this economic crisis. So you have an economy that is really, um, really being squeezed. And that was prior to the crisis. Some have described what, uh, what the economy was, was structured around as a, as a state-sponsored Ponzi scheme, whereby there weren't enough dollars actually to sustain, uh, to sustain what was happening. So it's hardly surprising then that with rampant corruption and uh, increasing unemployment, that there would, and uh, of course a, a government imposed WhatsApp tax, that there would be protests because of the frustration at the political organization of, of the state widespread structural frustrations. And of course, COVID-19 has exacerbated this, not just in Lebanon or Iraq, but, but across the region more broadly. Um, there's estimated to be a fiscal deficit of 10% of GDP by 2020, an increase of 7%. There's a drop of, an estimated drop of around 20 billion in remittances from 62 billion US dollars to 42 billion, according to the World Bank. In Lebanon, of course, there's there's a real uh, emphasis here. 12.5% of GDP is, is gained from remittances, most of which come from the Gulf. So if the Gulf is dramatically affected by COVID-19, then there are knock-on implications of this, particularly in Lebanon, which is, as we've, we've just seen, facing a whole host of issues of its own. And then there's, there's states of emergency that were declared to try and counter, uh, counterbalance against the pandemic that were trying to address the political crises that quickly emerged. And whilst most constitutions across the world have clauses implemented in them to have, um, have emergency powers given to the legislature and the government to address these questions, it also is a, essentially gives, gives ruling elites and authoritarian rulers scope to increase their power and uh, basically give some cover for author increasing authoritarianism, which is a big concern for, for many. What COVID-19 has done is it's increased intersectional challenges in terms of gender, in terms of youth unemployment, where 27% of the people across the region are unemployed, 80% of whom work in the informal sector, which has been incredibly badly hit. There's been a 20% drop in household income, 7% drop in GDP. Most are, are working in informal settings. 
there's been a dramatic impact on the housing sector. And of course, that just affects people living in homes. What about the people who are living in, in refugee camps or temporary shelter? This, this COVID-19 and the, the economic structure of political life across the region is intersectional. It exacerbates existing inequalities in terms of camps, in terms of the provision of welfare. When you factor in increase, uh, the drop in oil prices, the ensuing drop in tourism that will undeniably happen, the region gets a lot of money from tourism, um, you, you have a, a perfect storm that is hitting a number of states and indeed the most vulnerable across a number of these states in a pretty devastating way. So much so that you have a number of states that are traditionally seen as oil rich, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, for example, that are having to, to really dip into post oil funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds that were designed to be used in the post oil environment. Saudi Arabia's NEON project, which needs an estimated $500 billion to get off the ground, is clearly going to struggle. And that's even before we mention the challenges of the Yemen conflict and Jamal Khashoggi. It increases inequality and divisions, and it exacerbates existing tensions, divisions within society, divisions over inclusion and exclusion, refugees and citizens. And this, I think, the structural issue with regard to protest, with regard to COVID, it exacerbates tensions between rulers and ruled. It opens up questions about the nature of politics, the nature of the polis, the nature of, of the society and the relationship that it needs to have with the other, both internally and externally. The concerns about rampant corruptions, concerns about creeping authoritarianism and economic challenges that remain unaddressed. These are internal existential questions that will be addressed and questioned in the coming years. And then the way that they are addressed, I think will have serious implications for the nature of the region. And that is of course, before I even mention relations with the United States that are up for grabs, concern about the Israeli annexation of Palestine and the ongoing questions about relations with China, the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims, India and other major powers in the world. So it's a moment of flux, states in the region facing existential challenges, and right now, it's unclear as to which way things may go, but it does seem like the, those most affected, those hardest hit by a whole host of issues are gonna be hit even harder in the years to come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there's so much there to unpack. So I'm sure there'll be lots, lots of questions afterwards. I certainly have written down several of them, but we're gonna move on next now to uh, Wayne David, who is going to, um, maybe touch on some of the subjects, uh, like, for example, the UK's role in the region. So please go ahead, Wayne. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Belle, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And the first thing I want to say is that I've been in post for uh, just over two and a half months. Um, I wouldn't uh, suggest for one moment that I have an encyclopedic, encyclopedic knowledge of the area, of the issues, that uh, some of the other contributors have. But what I thought would be useful is that I, if I give my impression, really, of uh, having looked at the area and talked to many, many people and read as much as I possibly can, of my uh, Im impressions of Middle East and North Africa. The first thing I'd stress is that I'm amazed by the degree of complexity that is in the region. Pride of cultures, religions, ethnicity, alliances, politics, differences between rulers and ruled, and, and many other differences as well, too. And, of course, the situation has recently been made more difficult, more complex, because of the, the impact of COVID-19 and its disproportionate impact on uh, the less well-off citizens of many of these countries. I think one of the other features of the region as a whole, especially the Middle East, is the extensive intervention of uh, outside powers and countries. The United States has got a, a long-standing interest, of course, in, in the area, but recently I think we've seen Russia become increasingly interested and asserting its, its own interests. We've seen that in, in Syria, and we're also seeing it in Libya today where the Russians are very involved through uh, their mercenaries and uh, are in conflict with uh, uh, Turkish militia in particular. 
Um, the other country, of course, which has taken a, a very, very uh, proactive role is, is Turkey itself. Turkey is involved in Syria, as I mentioned, but also in, involved in uh, Libya, but also in Northern Iraq, where we've had a, a long-standing concern over the, uh, the, the Kurds in the northern part of that country. But I think that another feature that we're seeing you know, becoming increasingly important is that the area is becoming an arena for proxy conflicts, the most classic of which is in Yemen today, where the, the Houthi separatists are being strongly supported by Iran, the other coalition uh, opposing them, led by Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE strongly involved as well. And that is on top of a humanitarian disaster, which is getting much, much worse because of, of COVID-19. And that in many ways sums up the, the complexity and the involvement of, of outside players in an area which is extremely poor. Of course, much of my time for the last two and a half months has been taken up with another issue, and that's the proposed annexation of up to 30% of the US Bank by Israel. In January of this year, we saw President Trump uh, publishing his so-called deal of the century with the central stipulation that there should be annexation of up to 30% of the West Bank by the state of Israel. And then shortly after that, we had the coalition government in Israel being formed, led once again by a Benjamin Netanyahu. And central to their agenda is that program of annexation. As we speak, the situation is very unclear. Um, I understand that um, Netanyahu has put forward uh, four different scenarios of uh, annexation, one ranging uh, on the one hand from a creeping annexation to a maximalist approach. But what is clear is that whatever program is finally agreed by the Israeli cabinet, it'll have to have the consent of the United States of America. Now, many countries throughout the world, including Britain and the British Labour Party, we have strongly opposed annexation, and we have done so for essentially three reasons. Firstly, it is a blatant breach of international law and a breach of innumerable United Nations resolutions. Secondly, it puts a real profound question mark over whether or not a two-state solution uh, will be viable in the future, because we fundamentally believe that long-lasting peace will only be achieved between Israel and Palestine when you have two states which are set up uh, through negotiation, which are both viable and which both feel safe. I think annexation puts that profoundly in doubt. And thirdly, we're against annexation because it creates even more instability in an already insta unstable region. Now, I don't know if annexation will go ahead. Uh, it's difficult to tell exactly what's going to happen. But what is clear is that anything which is agreed in Israel will need the explicit support of the United States. But it's clear that there is tremendous pressure on the United States of America, uh, both from the uh, Arab states, the UAE and Jordan in particular. And there are reservations which have been expressed increasingly on Capitol Hill, Washington, and within the Trump administration itself. You have um, Secretary of State Pompidou, who recently toured the Middle East, and has reported back that uh, he now has concerns over whether or not it is uh, the appropriate course of action at this moment to take. You have Jared uh, Kushner, who is extremely close to the, uh, the Trump administration, also experiencing, expressing concerns about uh, what form annexation might take. However, on the other hand, you have uh, the ambassador to uh, Israel from the United States, David Friedman, who is strongly in favor. But I think it's, it's worth emphasizing that the concerns which have been expressed to the Trump administration from the Arab states in particular 
are extremely significant. And I would just mention Jordan, for example. Uh, the King there has mentioned his concern to the uh, Trump administration. Two million Palestinians living in Jordan. The Jordan Valley could well be part of the, the annexation program. And he is concerned about the ongoing destabilization and implications for ongoing violence, which all of that might mean. The United Arab Emirates is concerned that the uh, Islamicist front, that is, as they say it, led by Turkey, financed uh, in part by Qatar's money. The UAE are worried about their, uh, their program of normalization of relations with Israel might be brought into, into jeopardy because there's a tremendous popular feeling amongst Arab states and their populations in support of the Palestinian people. And the UAE don't want to be seen on the wrong side of that. And of course, both UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, United States, they are also concerned about Iran. And the United States is also concerned about maintaining, reinforcing its alliance against uh, is Iran, which they see as a huge destabilizing influence in the area. What will happen next? Who knows? It's difficult to say. Um, my guess is there might well be a move towards a limited small scale annexation with the promise of a uh, gathering momentum in the future. But much will depend on what happens in the United States and in the presidential elections. Because Joe Biden has made it very clear that he does not support annexation. And if he becomes president of the United States, there'll be a, a reorientation of United States policy. And that is enormously significant. Could I just finish by saying, what should Britain's role be? Well, uh, the short answer to that is that I think Britain should be far more proactive than what it is. Uh, Britain is claiming now to be a country which is developing a global strategy outside of the European Union. It is seeking to engage rhetorically, at least, with the, the rest of the world in a new kind of way. But what I think that the British government should be doing, and what Labour's in favour of, is then firstly taking a more positive and proactive role in terms of Yemen, where we are a, a, a key uh, key holder there, pen holder, and I think it's important that we give as much support as we possibly can to, to Martin Griffiths in the United Nations. In my view, Yemen cannot be resolved through conflict. One side will not win and the other side will lose. At some point, there has to be a negotiated agreement, and the sooner that happens, the better. And Britain, using its undoubted influence, should be doing all it can to make sure that it happens quickly. And finally, as far as Israel and Palestine is concerned, our Prime Minister has recently uh, come forward with emphatic statements against annexation, and he's recently penned an article in a leading Jewish newspaper in Israel. But I think that Britain needs to be seen far more as an honest broker between Israel and, and Palestine, and we need to be more proactive in making sure that the, the two-state solution is once again firmly on the international agenda. And I think we need to be proactive in doing that through United Nations and through other organizations, but using our new diplomatic role in the world to ensure that that happens. Well, thank you so much um, for those, those words, Wayne. Um, again, I have many, many questions to ask, which I will be doing um, after everyone. Uh, has finished speaking. Uh, you were talking there mostly um, about the possible annexation of parts of the occupied West Bank, but also Yemen, which I know is a subject that um, that uh, Dr. May uh, uh, Darwish wants to mention, as well as other military interventions in, across the region. So I will um, hand over to, to you right now. Right. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be uh, talking to you all today. Uh, so mainly my very short uh, presentation is not really going to be about particular conflict, but I would like to draw some reflections about the situation in the region and the situation of conflict and violence in the region. 
And uh, it would be surprising to many, for, for many to hear that actually the region before 2011 was not particularly high on any indicator when it comes to conflict. And that was particularly a debate among scholars and uh, policy makers, but also experts of the region, especially after the end of the Cold War, whether the Middle East is a region that's naturally prone to conflict and violence. And this debate was sort of resolved and everyone was in agreement that actually the Middle East is not really prone to violence or conflict. And the level of conflict and violence before 2011 was not actually the highest in the Middle East. And the region was on all indicators among average all other regions in the world. And somehow looking at this, many scholars started discounting many of the let's say, neo-orientalist explanations that maybe it's because of sociocultural factors or maybe because of the presence of oil in the region. And they started more looking at the region as some sort of a, let's say, a, an area where there are many interests and interactions. Nevertheless, after 2011, it became much harder to, to square this idea that the Middle East is not really prone to conflict. And to just give you some indicators that of all the conflicts that emerged in the whole world since 2011, half of them were in the Middle East. The Syria conflict has become one of the deadliest armed conflict uh, since the end of the Cold War, just after the Rwanda genocide. And since 2012, the Middle East is scoring the highest on all indicators when it comes to conflict, even higher than Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia in terms of death or conflict-related death in particular. But more importantly, just looking at events in the region, we would see the Middle East having a large numbers of civil wars occurring in Syria and Iraq, uh, a little bit in Sudan as well, but also some conflicts are induced by military interventions like in Yemen or in Bahrain or in Libya that after the intervention led to the emergence of a civil, uh, a civil war afterwards. But also there is an increased level of repression across all Arab states, let alone the whole issue of the annexation. So looking across the region, there is definitely evidence that the level of violence but also the level of conflict have reached a peak especially in the last decade and somehow it's very easy for many to go back to these neo-orientalist explanation talking about the sociocultural factors or just talking about the different uh let's say factors related to oil or maybe just the, the, let's say, the very old explanations about sectarianism and religion and so on and so forth. So what I want to do here briefly is just reflect on some of the three key factors that, in my view, have shaped this level of violence in the region, especially after 2011, giving you a little bit of examples. And these three factors are mainly related to some structural issues, the relation of the region with the outside world, but also the perception of several regional actors. The, uh, the first factor is really about the history of the region. And somehow it is about the conditions of violence and the conditions of conflict. So we cannot really discount that for violence and for conflict to occur, there needs to be some conditions which are present in any region and somehow the middle east with its history of colonialism the history of its state formation has provided a very rich environment for conflict and to an extent we cannot really understand many of the tensions and the conflicts at the moment without necessarily taking into account the history of the state formation the history of resistance in the region the resistance to colonialism the penetration and the interest of several great powers in the region. So this is the, the first factor. The second factor is really related to the role of, let's say, great powers in the Middle East. And especially after 2011, what could be described as the retreat of the US from regional politics. And somehow, whether this retreat is a real or a perceived one, it had a huge impact on let's say the regional dynamics, but also on the incentives for violence and conflict in the region. So after 2000, 
2013 in particular, at the time where the Obama administration actually took a step back and rejected an intervention in Syria and went back on that decision, it became very clear that the US is no longer interested in being involved directly in military interventions in the Middle East. Nevertheless, despite this decision, the, the Middle East remained a very important area of interest in US foreign policy. Arms sales were still going to the region. The US was still supporting many regimes in the region, supporting the Yemen war and the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. And to an extent, so this sort of retreat was a qualified retreat. It was not necessarily a retreat of all the presence of the US, uh, uh, let's say, role in the region, but it was somehow a change in the role that the US is no longer interested in being involved directly, but rather indirectly and in a less costly manner. And again, this sort of retreat was related to, to many factors in the domestic debates in the US, but also the conditions in the region. The Trump administration came afterwards and started saying, well, no, we're not going to follow Obama. We're going full on changing a little bit the interaction with Iran, bringing back the sanctions and trying somehow acting spontaneously in the Middle East. Nevertheless, despite Trump's effort to reinvigorate the US role in the region, it was not really reinvigorated, but rather many regional actors were still perceiving that the US is no longer interested. So again, it's not really about the real or the objective retreat of the US from the region, but it was about the signals that were sent to many regional actors that the US is no longer interested in providing direct security for the Gulf monarchies. They are no longer interested in providing the security umbrella for many regimes in the region, and everyone will have to be on their own. And that created some level of insecurity, some level of opportunities for several regional actors that they have to act on their own. And that's where many military interventions started because many regional actors realized, okay, this is our moment. We have to find our own interest and we have to go for it. And basically that was enabled by the US signals that were sent to many regional actors since 2013. So we've seen, for example, the Yemen crisis in that sort of context, but we've also seen several other issues emerging that many regimes are applying more repression. Egypt, for example, not really caring about the US threatens, um, threatening to apply sanctions after the coup d'etat in Egypt and so on and so forth, because simply the US is not longer, let's say, the most feared actor in the region. And it does not really apply these constraints anymore. So we have this sort of moment of insecurity that pushed, but also encouraged many actors in the region to just go after what they want, to use their military power, and let alone that there has been a militarization that has been going on for a whole decade before that, and it was just the time to use the arms. The third factor that I talk about is really about the opportunity moment. So not all the violence that emerged were not really driven by fears or threats, but some of them were also driven by a sense of opportunity. After 2011, the regional environment was changing. The US is no longer interested in being involved directly in the region. And therefore, many regional actors saw this as an opportunity to actually play a bigger role or just put forward a certain agenda. And therefore, many of the actors started taking this as a moment of opportunity in order to do things that they were not able to do before. The Syria crisis started with this, that basically many regimes in the region, they saw this as an opportunity to just curb and weaken the accents of resistance in the region. The same thing with Libya. Many regional actors saw that this was an opportunity to get rid of Qaddafi which was not really their favorite ally at the moment. And therefore, there were many incidents and many opportunities that were created that somehow led many regional actors to 
seek violence in order to change that regional structure. The same thing also happened with many armed non-state actors that emerged at the time. They saw this as an opportunity in order to play a certain agenda or in order to gain some uh, success in certain areas on the ground. And therefore, it's really important to situate this sort of violence and this sort of conflict in the moment that was happening and in this decade that was happening between 2011 until 2020. Unfortunately for the future, it doesn't really seem too optimistic at the moment because these conditions of uncertainty but also opportunities are still there. The U.S. is still no longer interested in playing any hegemonic role in the region. More involvement came from Russia as a result, but also China, but also other regional actors started looking to play bigger roles. Many of the Gulf countries, for example, they started not just controlling what's happening in the Middle East, they also want to invest in the Horn of Africa, play a bigger role. Egypt now is threatening to intervene directly in Libya. So we have a whole set of um, opportunities and a whole set of incentives created by this structure. Unfortunately, this is unlikely to disappear in the very short um, period of time. COVID-19 is even creating more opportunities for actions and for violence and for many actors to take the moment in order to gain successes on certain agendas. And therefore, I mean, that's basically um, what I wanted to contribute. In general, there are so many details, but I think this is more or less, let's say, the map for understanding a little bit of why the Middle East has turned a little bit more violent after 2011 than usual. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and actually, talking about that particular issue, you were saying, you know, um, talking about the US's role in the region, how it's maybe taking a, a, a sort of a back seat. I think um, Dr. Edward Wisnage wanted to talk specifically uh, about Iran um, and a po the possibility of a post-US Middle East. So perhaps you could uh, talk us through there, you know, obviously Iran is, is, is increasing its influence or arguably increasing its influence in the region. So I'll hand it over to you now. Great. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you can all hear me okay. So yeah, in the next few minutes, I'm going to be giving my thoughts on Iran and the evolving geopolitical dynamics in the Middle East. And I'm going to look at some of the challenges and opportunities it faces in the years ahead. And particularly in light of this perceived declining role of the US, which I think will be a feature as we move towards a perhaps a new multipolar era in the region. And I think there's no doubt that this current decade um, will be hugely important one for Iran and its place in the Middle East. Uh, the past decade has also seen huge changes and the Islamic Republic remains and endures as, as a thorn in the side of the US and its allies' aspirations for the region. And I think for Iran staying true to its message of maintaining independence in foreign policy, whilst cultivating various alliances of convenience where necessary, and then also strengthening its own alliance network in the form of the resistance axis will be really important. In terms of some of the challenges I think that Iran's going to face, um, well, there's this wider sense of geopolitical uncertainty, which I think May and Simon uh, and Bell, you all, uh, and Wayne all, all alluded to. And this sense of a US uh, rolling back of US influence or US decline doesn't necessarily mean it's no long, uh, longer a consideration. Of course, it still has numerous bases in the region. It still surrounds uh, Iran on almost every flank. Um, but I think there's the, a, a knock-on effect of this kind of um, pulling back is that we see this outsourcing of aspects of US foreign policy to increasingly reckless regional actors. And we see the same old think tanks in DC pushing the same tired, cliched narratives and demonization of Iran. We just saw the news today of, of a massive fake news drive by, by the UAE and its allies. And it's while it's good that we, you know, we are seeing these kind of um, things called out, we're still seeing concerted efforts by anti-Iranian forces in the region, which is a, a big issue for Tehran. Um, and that's, you know, this kind of outsourcing is, is emboldened certain actors. We're seeing increasing Israeli recklessness, this possible uh, alleged role in the recent explosions in, in Iran of key nuclear infrastructure. And so this sense that, you know, there's a kind of goading of Iran by regional enemies and the US and, and efforts to foment unrest within Iran as well, using increasingly sophisticated cyber attacks and, and supporting certain groups within Iran as well. Um, 
less frustration, of course, from, from the side of the Islamic Republic in terms of the perceived weakness of the EU, particularly in light of what happened with the JCPOA. So issues with this use of Instex as a, Instex as a, uh, a replacement for SWIFT, that's been frustrating. The US still has control over important financial levers uh, in the world, and it continues with its own petulant responses and collectively punishing Iranians from all walks of life. So I think we'll see subsequent, subsequently a much more of a, a look east policy, which, which Iran has pursued in the past and will continue to do so, uh, where its interests are far better served. And there's also some domestic uncertainty over Iran's political direction. We have elections coming up next year, presidential elections, a positive conservative swing. That's not a challenge for Iran itself. That's a, you know, a feature of the Iranian electoral politics. And um, we, we have this regular moving between you know, more pragmatic or reformist factions and, and conservative or, or principalist um, factions in Iranian politics. Um, regardless, Iran remains remarkably resilient when it comes to internal changes. You know, we will also see the possible succession of Khamenei on the, on the horizon as well, which will have major implications for Iran's um, position in the world and the region uh, beyond that. But as I said, it's proved very resilient to these uh, internal changes and also to external pressures as well and changes in the external environment. So it's, you know, gone through losses of key personnel, uh, Soleimani being a key example. Uh, so despite the best efforts of its enemies, it, it, it seems to endure. But there are also opportunities for Iran, and this is why I want to kind of come towards the um, idea of this notion of, of perhaps a post-US Middle East. Um, even if we look today, you know, issues of coronavirus, which, which were touched on, um, which have, have, you know, certainly provided some opportunities, some problematic opportunities for, for the various actors, we've actually seen opportunities for rapprochement with the United Arab Emirates, for example, and, and Iran, uh, with the provision of humanitarian aid by Abu Dhabi um, to Tehran early in the crisis. Um, there are also other opportunities as a result of changes in the geopolitical environment. So I think as, as I mentioned before, the axis of resistance will continue to provide a very strong and durable alliance network for Iran. It, it's something that's key really for, for Iran's own national security as well. And, and a crucial point here is that Palestinian factions, notably Hamas, are once again on board um, as part of the resistance axis, uh, as Israel and, and Arab Gulf states have, have moved towards their own kind of rapprochement. So that's something that will um, is, is certainly an opportunity for Iran to further uh, it's aimed in the region uh, and also to showcase the fact that it's not a sectarian actor, that it has uh, um, links with, with a range of different actors. I think the impending US drawdown from Iraq uh, and this broader sense of a transition towards maybe a post US Middle East does afford the chance for the region's leading states to have a greater say in determining their own security free of external influence. And the Islamic Republic has long been keen on region first security solutions that help it maintain its own desire for independence in foreign policy and reduce external pressure. I think the buy-in of key states such as Saudi Arabia into these proposals that Iran has had for regional security have always been unrealistic in the light of its own US security guarantees. But I think there is a palpable sense of abandonment by some key allies, including Saudi Arabia. We see the lack of response to, to the attacks against key oil installations in 2019 uh, as a feature of that. And I think this sense of US unreliability and its misreading of regional dynamics under Trump was, was brought into sharp focus with the assassination of, of Qasim Soleimani earlier this year. Uh, and I think for Saudi Arabia and its allies, this highlighted the real risks that they faced as potential targets of Iranian responses to the killing. But ironically, this very act has the potential to open space for better relations between Iran and key regional actors. We, we see the rush of regional states to placate Iran in, in the immediate aftermath of, of Soleimani's murder. And also the response it allowed Iran to showcase its military capabilities. And this is something that's often decried as impotent in the face of US military might but it gave a clear and calibrated warning to the US and its regional allies. I think furthermore, as the conflict in Syria draws down uh, and the appetite for sustained engagement by the Saudi coalition in Yemen wanes, uh, the avenues for conflict between the two sides, competing visions of regional order are also reduced if, if we look at Saudi Arabia and Iran. So if we have a sustainable peace emerging from both tragic conflicts, um, that will only improve the possibilities for, for wider rapprochement. Uh, I think the role of the region's traditional mediating power, Oman, though it's also going through its own um, transitional phase at the moment, I think will be important. And I think we'll see an emerging 
influence of Iraq as a potential bridge between the two powers, such as Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, I think that'll be important. It's imperative that this kind of space is provided to facilitate the ton in, in the relationship, if we're looking at Saudi Arabia and Iran, that has the potential to really impact the region and regional dynamics in both positive and negative ways. And I think, you know, as May alluded to, we've seen how the Middle East has suffered under successive imperial, imperial agendas of Britain, the US and others. And it's, you know, very hard to see any positives from this kind of external meddling. And, and it's increasingly frustrating when you see the, the kind of hypocrisy of governments, including the UK's, who insist on funding odious regimes and offering carte blanche to adventurous and impetuous rulers while at the same time charging Iran. I think this double standards, unfortunately, endure when it comes to Western foreign policy in the region. And I think I want to end my presentation here by doing something rather counterintuitive, and that's say maybe maybe don't listen to me. You know, we, we see events like this proliferating in current times with the, with the opportunities that the online environment affords. Uh, and obviously they're important for, for our people standing, their careers, et cetera, and, 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 and output. But here I am, I'm a, a, a privileged white male at a British institution, and I'm offering my own hot take on Iran and region. You know, so in a sense, I'm, I'm part of the problem. I'm involved in the production of knowledge from one of the cause of imperial excess. So despite the fact that I work for a great institution that has a wonderful social justice mission, I think I'm, I'm part of that issue. So I think more than ever, we need to listen to uh, and be live to real authentic voices on the ground. And that means inviting people whose voices aren't normally heard and given space to alternative perceptions of regional realities. I think for too long, we've had narratives shaped by think tanks, mostly in the US, who perpetuate the same myths and increasingly act as mouthpieces for foreign governments. One of the great things about the work we do is that we're seeing many young and upcoming scholars from the region. Um, the work that we're trying to do with, with in CEPAD and, and May's latest um, project with Somali institutions is a good exemplar of that. And I think the next time you know we, we do these kind of events, it's so important to have someone from Abdulaziz University, have someone from Shahid Bahesh University and, and other regional centres. I think we need to ward, move towards a future where the Middle East, or really let's scrap that term, let's think about West Asia and North Africa, you know, uh, it is cast in the image of its own people and not under designs of outside interests, I think, which only perpetuates violence and conflict. And so I think a post-US future for the region is a real opportunity for key regional powers to forge their own collective narrative and ultimately ensure their own security. And I'll leave it at that. Um, and thank you very much for that. I would also uh, second that last message there. Um, I think uh, that is also really important for journalism as well and it is something that is beginning to change but needs to change faster and I say that as someone who also uh, is a white person from, uh, from the UK so um, I also agree with that very very much so I think it, it's particularly interesting and you mentioned the fake news um, drive there was an article that was written by the Daily Beast today about um, I think that's what you were referencing about a bunch of uh, basically fake people that were posing um, as commentators pushing particular, I think it was pro UAE Gulf lines, and um, that just goes to show just how 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 difficult the situation can be if we don't listen to people from here. Um, so, uh, but that said, I think um, we now have about thirty five minutes for questions. Um, I and we have some that have already come through now um, that I will now uh, uh, read to um, read to all the panelists. These aren't necessarily, some of them are directed specifically, some of them are not. Um, so I think I will uh, perhaps open the floor just to see, uh, who, because these are sort of subjects everyone has been um, addressing. So um, the first question comes from um, Mohammed, Mohammed Taufik Ali. Um, he says, will COVID-19 pandemic mark the end game for Iraq's, Syria's and Lebanon's mass popular uprisings? Are each of Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, fragile, failing, or failed states, um, and a resolution, what about UN involvement? So that's quite a sort of wide-ranging um, question there. Uh, I'm not sure who of the panelists would, would like to answer that, talking about uh, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon's mass uprisings in the end game for them. Do we have someone who would like to jump in there? Yeah, Simon, would you like to, to jump yeah. in there? Sure. Um, I think that's a really good question. I've spoken to people who've been out protesting in, in Lebanon in particular, and there's a concern. And obviously, there's a concern uh, that, that protesters are facing an existential dilemma. I've used that word quite a bit today, but I think it's quite apt given the, the context. 
uh, the, the dilemma, of course, is do we stay at home and keep ourselves safe uh, from COVID-19 or do we go out on the streets and protest against the people that are stopping us from being able to feed our families? So th that's the dilemma. Do you try and, and facilitate reform in order to feed yourselves and your families or do you keep yourself and your family safe from a medical pandemic? And I think what a lot of people are doing is saying, well, we need to go and continue this protest. We need to keep the momentum going. We need to facilitate change because we're not going to get any, any support otherwise if we don't facilitate a change and, and bring about a, a serious and lasting change to the, um, to the sect-based ordering of, of politics in Lebanon. And I, I think the same thing could be said in, in Iraq, that the pandemic is a serious concern, of course. But there are other equally serious things that people are worried about, including surviving and finding food for themselves and for their families. Yeah, I would agree with that, that uh, reading as well. I mean, being based here in Lebanon, certainly. Um, I mean, the protests were obviously dampened down because of lockdown regulations. But really, although the financial crisis here is anchored in decades of mismanagement and corruption, um, the pandemic obviously added an extra level um, of a sort of accelerator. And right now um, it is people that people are going hungry. I mean, it's, I've never seen a country break down so quickly. Um, and and uh, I think that doesn't mean that it's gonna stop popular uprisings. It might actually accelerate them. So, um, but again, I, did, I think predicting the future is hard in this region. So we'll have to see, but hopefully things will get better for people here. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is by Anwar Jauhar. Um, which is looking at Kuwait. Will Kuwait, in your opinion, be able to shift away from its heavy reliance on oil over the near future? And if not now, how will this impact the dynamics within the country for its people, both local and foreign? Is there anyone from the panel who would like to jump in with that in particular? Or <laughs> we have uh, no one who is willing to. <laughs> it's a very, very <laughs> tricky subject. I, I don't want to dominate a conversation. Um, well, please go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Please. I'll, I'll give a short. Yeah, Kuwait take. is not my uh, Kuwait is not my expertise, so I wouldn't be able to answer that one. So. Although I did see Eddie switching his microphone on, and um, I think just to say after you. <laughs> That's oh. all. <laughs> right. Thanks. Well, I think Kuwait was is well. It's obviously got one of the the most long term sets of, of financial planning for the future. It's got one of the oldest sovereign wealth funds. It's been very clear that it has to plan for a post oil future it has to be organized for that. Um, but that also means that, the, that there are the reserves to address uh, this, this pandemic because of the organization that it's had. Now, the, the question remains, I guess, to what extent will the pandemic draw down on these, um, these longstanding oil reserves? Um, will it erode much of the capital that's been put aside to try and facilitate the transition away from oil uh, and if it does then Kuwait's in a, a slightly difficult position and there's a whole host of, of obviously delicate social um, civil society type questions that we don't really have time to go into now but it was well placed to move away from its heavy reliance on oil I would argue but the challenge posed by COVID-19 and the ability to withstand that is the million dollar question, or the billion dollar question in this case, whether it will be able to, to keep most of that fund intact or whether it will just have that drained away by trying to address COVID. Maybe uh, Edward, you wanted to come in there if you want to, to add a, a couple of points. I, I, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't have anything to add to that. I think that sums up very clearly. Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm just gonna move through more of the questions. I have some of my own as well. Um, I don't know whether this one perhaps would be best answered by, by May here, but um, this question is, uh, do panelists see the state um, in the Gulf and region in general weakening, becoming more authoritarian, um, or perhaps more willing to engage with stakeholders in the longer term? Also in broad terms, how can civil society, human rights, NGOs, for example, best try to influence uh, menace state conduct? Um, by the traditional international human rights route, or is there a possibility that visions of a shared future to sustainable development goals might present a less antagonistic way of engaging civil society. 
Um, sorry, I just lost the last bit of question there. And the state, or is that just wishful thinking? Um, yeah, I'm happy to I'm happy to answer that. I mean, from our experience of of this particular issue in 2011 was most of the NGOs and most of the let's say stakeholders um, when it came to the resistance protest, they were completely um, not resonating with the people. They were completely disconnected from what was happening on the ground and they had their own agenda. They've been working there on the ground, but it was very clear that most of the civil societies and the NGOs, they were not particularly engaged with societies in the Middle East. And that's where most of the successful, um, let's say, um, attempts were coming from mainly the political Islam movements like the Muslim Brothers or the Salafis that were more resonant um, in the societies. And to an extent, I think the main challenge of uh, the civil society movements at the moment that they are entirely banned. I mean, speaking of Egypt, for example, they're completely underground or they just moved outside of Egypt because they are not even allowed to operate even to a minimum level. Speaking about other countries, I don't see how they could operate in conflict um, zones. I mean, there are some role for civil societies and NGOs to play in uh, supporting people or human rights and conflicts, but at the moment, definitely, it is becoming really minimal. And unfortunately, it doesn't really look very optimistic in the future because most of the countries, for example, like Egypt or other countries before 2011, they were more or less compelled to give more space for the civil society because they were engaged with like the, neo, um, the neoliberal agendas, getting more aid from the West. And in return, they would open up the space for civil society. They would open up the space for opposition. Unfortunately, this does not really operate anymore in the region because there is no leverage. And most of the regimes, they don't really have that sort of, um, let's say, uh, pressure anymore. So I don't really see this happening in the near future. Maybe there will be other structural changes in the future that would lead to a different dynamic with the civil society, but not at the moment. Thank, thank you for that, May. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but otherwise I can move on to the next question, um, which I think actually maybe Ed would be maybe best place for this one. Um, although of course anyone else who wants to jump in uh, is from Asif um, Ahmed. Uh, how do we define the UAE's increasing thirst for regional supremacy through interventions which seems most likely destabilizing beyond the Gulf and North Africa, especially given its, si uh, its size in terms of area and population compared to the other heavyweights like Saudi Arabia or Iran? And is it time for the world to accept the one state reality with equal rights for all? Um, personally, you know, the UAE, having, I was actually born there, it, its role in the region is very interesting and has taken, I mean, its foreign policy has changed massively over the last few decades. Um, and is obviously taking a very front seat role at the moment in the region. So I will hand it over to Edwards to continue that. Sure. I mean, uh, not a huge expert on the UAE, but I shall have a go. Um, I, I think whether it's, a, I don't know if it's a thirst for regional supremacy it, within, within the Middle East itself. I think it's, you know, it kind of has an incredibly sort of dynamic and ambitious foreign policy and it wants to, um, you know this dissent that is you know trying to model itself as as an entrepreneur and you know in the region and has been very successful in doing that and then wants to then push that thinking forward in terms of um having uh forward kind of economic bases in the one of africa um it is one aspect of that uh, and may would be able to talk uh, a lot more on this um with her research on on gulf relations with the horn of africa but i think um it's remarkably kind of activist given its relatively small size in terms of uh, actual you know um local population um it, you know its relationship with iran for example is 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 very complex which is why we don't see it pursuing quite as a uh, harder line as say saudi arabia um because you know their their economies are they're intertwined and the number of iranians um in the united arab emirates is 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 very significant and and the uae was you know hugely important especially during the kind of when the sanctions were at their heaviest 
as a, as a kind of clearinghouse for for sanctions evasion um, by Iran. So um, you know there, there's there's it plays a very important role for Iran. Um, the, the final question, I, uh, I'm, I'm guessing this is more to more related towards the the, the, the Palestine question and the annexation. I'm I'm presuming. Um, is it time for the world to accept the one state reality with equal rights for all? Uh, I, I think others will want to come in on this as well. Um, <laughs> I don't know where to start with that question, really. Um, that is one of, of many, you know, takes uh, for, for solving the, the Israel-Palestine conflict that, that we've seen over the years, you know, um, if that were to ever come close to being a reality, yes, equal rights is the most important thing, but what do you do about the right of return? You know, how would that affect the demographic balance within any future single state? Um, you know, uh, so it is, it's, it's incredibly complex. Um, and I'll defer to my other colleagues on, on, on the other questions if they want to come in on that. Um, does anyone want to come in on that? Um, is anyone, is it uh, anyone here or? silence from the panel oh no Wayne would you like to would you like to come in if I, please go for it just, just make a, a brief comment I mean, I mean there are an increasing number of people unfortunately advising who are saying that the, the two-state solution is dead and the the only alternative is the creation of a single state and the struggle must be to you know, have equal rights for Palestinians. I mean, in, in my view, that, that is a recipe for, for conflict and disaster. Because I think that and fundamentally undermines what, what the state of Israel wants to be. And uh, if, if we were talking about it, any other part of the world, I think, but Israel-Palestine is, is in many ways unique. And I think that, you know, yeah, if you had the right of return, for example, of the increasing appropriate uh, amongst Palestinians, it'd be just a matter of time before the state of Israel becomes a Palestinian state. Uh, maybe that would be desirable for some, but for, for many Israelis, that would be anathema. Uh, and that's why I think that a two-state solution, however difficult and far away it might appear at the moment, is the only way to have prospect of sustainable peace to exist. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would agree with that, but I would also say that it's, it's, uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult to see as a reality, mainly um, because of what that two states, or the lack of perhaps the second state as it's envisioned by the various different um, mm -hmm. maps and peace plans being put forward, least of all um, Trump's peace plan that was put out in January. Um, and the other issue you know, is the erosion of, of sort of Palestinian land in places like the West Bank um, and East Jerusalem with the growth in the number of and size of settlements does make it hard to see how you can build a state from that. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, if you were to have a one state, this would mean that they would not be the same. It just wouldn't, the demographic, as, um, as I was mentioning, you'd have a demographic problem there. And I, don't, I think um, many rights groups uh, at least would argue um, you might end up having uh, the creation of, or they say there is already the creation of an apartheid state. So um, I, I think um, it is- Which would be wholly, wholly unacceptable. I mean, there are some people who say that there is an apartheid state already, but I, I, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a deeply complicated and depressing, um, solution I, I i just i mean there isn't a solution it almost feels like so um my answer to that would be i i i don't know if the world can accept this two state or one state or what it even means um but thank you so much for that so i'm going to move on to the next question um if, unless anyone else wants to come in there i don't know if anyone had anything to say about that um okay um i think this one is directly uh aimed at Simon um, by Darius Barrick. Apologies, by the way, if, if there's any mispronunciations of names, sorry about that. Um, so the question to you, uh, Simon, I don't know if you can read it there on your screen. Um, you've previously written about Saudi Arabia's largely unsuccessful attempts to securitize Iran as a threat um, and directing those securitization attempts at non-regional actors, primarily the US. Recent US activities and rhetoric suggest increasing receptiveness. Has there been a shift in the facilitating conditions? Has this been driven by Saudi or other actors? Do you see the attempts 
continuing. Great, thank you. Um, so this is, I guess, related to some quite theoretical work that I've done with regard to how Saudi Arabia has sought to, quote unquote, securitize Iran to the United States. And by that, um, the, the sort of the technical language means to frame Iran as an existential threat to, uh, quote unquote, normal politics. So there's a whole host of, of things that get down and dirty in the weeds with intellectually. But the, the basic premise there is that if you are trying to securitize something, you're trying to position it as an existential threat to your survival. And so there's been a lot of attempts from Saudi Arabia to frame Iran as an existential threat. You go back to the, the uh, US diplomatic cables from the mid 2000s released by WikiLeaks, uh, where you see um, King Abdullah, for example, calling for the US to quote unquote, cut off the head of the snake things like that, um, quite explicit calls for the US to strike against Iran and um, quite explicit framing of Iranian meddling and manipulation in a whole host of, of affairs across the region. So that's kind of what, uh, what was going on. And I was in the articles and pieces that I wrote, I was trying to explore how and why that, that took place. And there's a whole host of issues pertaining to regional context, the, the nature of, of conflict, the state fragmentation, tensions between Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, the position of the United States. So all of that is, is sort of percolating away. But I don't think that there's been a, a real shift in the, the facilitating conditions. I think it's more that um, Trump has been empowered, perhaps, um, perhaps only by himself or those around him. I don't think there's been anything particularly um, dramatic that's changed in the region. Uh, others may may disagree, but I would argue it's, it's Trump who's set out with a bit of a vision to do whatever it is that he wants to do. And it was him that was perhaps being a bit more receptive to striking, uh, to the securitization of, of Iran. Him, Bolton, Pompeo, Netanyahu, exact, uh, sort of taken together were were once called the B team. I think um, Mohammed bin Zayed was in there as well. Uh, so I think it's maybe the, the coalescence of, of that group of individuals who empowered Trump maybe made the US a little bit more receptive to this type of anti-Iranian positioning. But then I guess there's a broader current in, in the US, oh, particularly over the past couple of years, that has been more, um, more anti anti-Iran is something that Eddie's worked on a, a lot and can probably elaborate more than I can. But that would be my response. I don't think there's been a real shift on the ground. Um, the, the move to King Salman and Mohammed bin Salman was, I guess, reinforcing some of the, some of the Saudi strategies. You haven't seen a shift in, um, in Benjamin Netanyahu's approach towards Iran. It's the same old, same old. Uh, the interesting one, of course, is is the Emirati approach. And I say that only in terms of recent developments over the past couple of months, whereby there's been overtures towards Tehran from Abu Dhabi, uh, seemingly uh, reaching out through the, the COVID crisis as a means of providing support, perhaps um, with broader aspirations for, for something more. And I say that purely on the grounds that there have been there's been dialogue between the Emiratis and the Iranians for six, nine months now under the guise of discussions about shipping in the Persian Gulf. So that would be the only real change that, that I can suggest in, in the quote unquote facilitating conditions, which doesn't actually support the thesis that the US is more receptive. So if you look at it like that, I would argue that it's Trump and his, his cabal uh, in Washington, the Washington clique of think tanks that Eddie did such a good job of articulating. Um, and then the B team of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, and Mohammed bin Salman. So that would be my, my take on it, but I'm sure Eddie can elaborate more. Uh, would, would you like to elaborate more? Or... I, I mean, I, I tend to agree with everything Simon said. I, I would do, but I'm very conscious of the fact that we've only got 15 minutes left and there's loads of other questions. So, um, but I, I, would, I would really agree with pretty much everything Simon said there. Yeah, but um, we can talk about it afterwards if people want to. 
Um, so maybe we just, I'm sort of going through the questions here, um, given maybe we should sort of look maybe at Syria a bit more, um, as we haven't looked at that too much. Um, so there's been a question here from um, one of the attendees, who says any views on what might be the ultimate solution in Syria, issues there too of economic decline, global intervention, huge scale reconstruction needs, reconstruction needs, of course we've had, um, uh, you know, additional US sanctions very recently. There is a financial crisis in Syria that's, of course, linked to the financial crisis here in Lebanon um, with, you know, talk from, from at least some UN agencies of possible famine-like conditions in, in the coming years. And then, of course, massive reconstruction projects, which um, it's probably unlikely that, you know, the sort of former rebel areas that are now regime areas will get the same level of treatment as the... Um, Sort of more loyal areas for example so does anyone want to have a comment on that since we haven't really touched on on that just would anyone like to jump in there on, on syria and what what it might be looking like in in the years to come silence oh no simon coming in there you can but again i don't want to dominate when there's others who are far more qualified uh anyone else want to say anything <laughs> Can I can I just offer an extremely pessimistic scenario? Be, because sure. <laughs> I mean, the likelihood is that Assad, Assad will continue to consolidate his position. We're likely to see massive economic collapse within Syria. We'll therefore see greater migration, greater impoverishment of people, and greater instability, and probably the rise in part as a consequence of extremist Islam groups. I mean, the question will be, how, how does the world respond to that absolutely horrific implosion, which I fear might well take place then? Um, Simon, did you want to jump in there and mention something as well? Yeah, I'll just say a, a couple of words about, about Syria. I think we, we've known for a number of years now that Assad has ostensibly won the war, right? He's defeated opposition groups, what remains to be done is to stamp out any form of, of live opposition in whatever form that may be with the support of, of Russia and, and Iran. And that has, has led to some pretty devastating humanitarian crises, um, approaching 10 million people displaced from their homes. Um, well, I don't know, the best part of a million people dead. Legacy of, of post-traumatic stress disorder across Syria, generation, of children who won't have had education. This is not going to be an easy thing to resolve. Um, but I think what we will see is that the Assad regime will use whatever whatever governance strategies it can do to, to regulate all aspects of life, be it the, the moving around of people to ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again in the future. Um, as we've seen, I think it's, it's in Law 10 that allows for um, homes that have been seized to be allocated to particular groups. Um, and there'll be other strategies as well that are designed solely to ensure that the Assad regime stays in power. And that seems to be the priority right now. It doesn't seem to be um, economic rebuilding or reconstruction. It doesn't seem to be um, reconciliation. And there was a, a wonderful question, actually, in the, the Q&A from someone who asked about Northern Ireland and ripeness for peace deals. And there's certainly no ripeness in, in a peace, for a peace deal in Syria, given what has happened. And I don't, think that's, I don't think that's what the Assad regime wants anymore. It doesn't want a peace. It just wants to, to crush any form of, of opposition and be damned with it. And that's what it's certainly set about doing. Um, does anyone else have anyone? Yeah. Go, go, go yeah, it. just very, very quickly. Um, I, I think the only game in town on, in terms of the international, um, uh, you know, approaches to that is, is, is seems to be the Astana process. We don't hear anything more about the Geneva process that was happening, which involved the West. So it, it's essentially Turkey, Russia and Iran, uh, you know, running, um, running things there. And, and I think that's, you know, probably what they're hoping in terms of post-war reconstruction is in terms of um, embedding their own interests in Syria uh, and further in, you know, further in their kind of own strategic depth perceptions um, projections rather in there um, to, to involve themselves in the region. So I don't, I don't see much appetite really from, from the wider international community, um, but I think it would take that, you know, at a kind of UN level uh, in terms of wider reconstruction. Um, thank you for that. Actually, I th uh, we are running out of time, but there's a couple more questions we're going to go through. Um, I think that May might, 
she briefly touched on this in terms of um, Egypt, but of course any other panelist that wants to come in. Um, uh, so from Audrey Hirsch is what might be the long-term effects of COVID-19 on freedom expression rights in the region? So we're seeing this, this isn't exclusive to the Middle East um, and North Africa, but you know, regimes are using the excuse of the coronavirus to, to crack down on freedoms. Um, but since we're talking about men and region here, um, I don't know if maybe you want to jump in there or someone else wants to talk in there in terms of how this might have a long-term effect on freedoms. Yeah, I can just say very briefly, I think the, the freedom of expression has been already curbed in the region. And I think in a way the COVID-19 is not really helping anymore, but we could see a continuation of the same problems. So, for example, in Egypt, you would see, for example, doctors arrested if they start contesting some of the state policies about um, about how they're handling the COVID situation. You could see a little bit of control of the narrative in the media and uh, also lack of uh, transparency about many of the policies that the states are employing. And in a way, I think the way this situation is handled is only reflecting the problems that were already there and the, the lack of freedom of expression. But sadly, this is not a case just for the Middle East. Look at what's happening in England and in the UK. So this is, um, this is also another uh, example of how the freedom of expression is not just about repressing what people want to say, but sometimes it's also about controlling the narrative of what's being said. I would endorse that. I would 100% yeah, agree with what you just said there. Um, and just to add to that, I mean, there's obviously a lot of, I mean, again, not just the Middle East, but a lot of states who've pushed through emergency legislation that is, um, you can't really cycle back quickly. Um, and phones have been tapped, et cetera, for contract tracing and stuff like that. So uh, certainly in terms of repressions of freedom in Egypt specifically, I mean, that has been, you know, dead for a while. Um, with, and, that, and we're seeing that, I mean, um, play out over the coronavirus uh, crisis with, you know, doctors being arrested now, as well as activists and TikTok stars for multiple different reasons. So, um, yeah, and I'm just going to move on. Um, so there's a question from um, Omar Manasa. Oh, sorry. Can I just ask that? I think yeah. regimes across the region are very clever. Right? They're very clever at using the, the tools at their disposal in terms of law, in terms of technology. And they've, they've been able to not just relate to COVID, but they've been able to, to manipulate the law uh, and everything around it as a means of regulating control, regulating expression, regulating the scope for discourse and the narratives that pertain to particular events. And this is something that I think uh, if we were looking at lessons for the UK moving forward, there is a real need to hold states more to account in terms of their obligations to uh, international treaties, uh, membership of international organizations, human rights behavior, things like that. Because uh, whilst, whilst you may have signatories of, of a whole host of international uh, bodies or organizations, the, the deeds themselves are really not in line with the, the words. Sorry. No, I uh, absolutely know um, it's an important point. Um, actually, two people have now mentioned this now, so I'm going to shift to this question um, about Turkey, because we haven't really uh, touched on Turkey. We've mentioned it briefly as obviously being a major um, player in the region, uh, increasingly so in places like uh, Libya, where it's taken direct intervention and has been part of the deployment of not only Turkish troops, but Syrian mercenaries. So the question is, what is your opinion about Turkey in the Middle East as one of the main factors of unrest in the region? How uncertain is the future of Turkey and how much are the sounds shifting there? Um, and this also, I think, plays into a comment that Edward made about fake news drivers. And there's been a lot of sort of pro um, UAE style, um, you know, attacks on Turkey and Qatar as well. But at the same time, they are playing, you know, huge, you know, Turkey's playing a massive role in the region, of course, in Northern Syria and Libya specifically. So does anyone, would anyone like to tackle Turkey? Um, uh, please go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, sorry. All right. Just, just a few general comments. I mean, it strikes me as, as quite surprising. A few years ago, I was a member of the European Parliament. And um, I remember Turkey. Uh, was quite a serious country in terms of wanting to become a European member of the EU and a, a, a full full player. 
I mean, I think, but their, their application is still technically on the table, but nobody, nobody seriously entertains any prospect of happening. And I think under one of the last few years, we, the focus has gone elsewhere. And uh, uh, Turkey is transforming itself away from the, uh, the traditions which are established in the country and uh, at a Turkey into a, becoming an increasingly active um, Muslim state with a, a, a role for itself as a mini superpower. I think we're seeing that in, in northern Syria, but we're also seeing that in, um, in, in Libya as well. Uh, I, I actually think that their, their intervention in, in Libya has, has been helpful because they're supporting, in my view, a legitimate uh, government supported by the United Nations. But I think that's indicative of, the, of Turkey uh, becoming a mini power in its own right. It's still a nominal member of NATO, but I think increasingly we see tensions increasing within NATO over the next few years. And I think uh, that Turkey is a country to be watched, increasingly in alliance, I think, with, with Syria, with, um, with Iran, perhaps, as well, too. And um, does anyone have any more comments to add to that? Um, I think definitely Turkey, as you were saying, is taking a uh, maybe a more active or more maybe yeah, I mean, more active role in the region, specifically in Libya. Um, I don't know, to pay devil's advocate, I guess the other side would say that, um, you know, Turkey is sort of helping Libya become awash with weapons and that's a violation of the UN arms embargo. Um, and the other side would argue that um, the GNA, although the recognized government by the UN, is supported by some unsavory militias. Um, but I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Uh, subject on Libya specifically or, or Turkey. Okay, um, so we've got two minutes left and I think um, for the last question, um, just going through all the um, excellent questions that have been, um, that have been asked today. Um, I guess we should, I think we should sort of focus a little bit maybe on the UK's role, um, what their role should be. Um, this is coming up in different questions, so I'm sort of molding it into, into sort of a hybrid question. Um, you know, we talked about the US taking a step back, we talked about Turkey taking a step forward, um, the UAE specifically in the Gulf. The UK has um, arguably taken a sidestep and been a bit more of a quieter um, actor in the Middle East region, although in places like Egypt is still, of course, the single largest investor um, in Egypt, so it's still playing a prominent role. Uh, does anyone in the panel have a sort of uh, maybe a, a sort of idea about what the UK should be doing in the future or shouldn't be doing um, in terms of in terms of the region? Does anyone have a have many points on that? One very quick one: stop selling arms. That's actually very relevant today because actually I think they've restarted selling arms to Saudi. Yep. It literally broke a few hours ago. Um, despite the fact that Saudi has been accused of, actually all sides of the conflict in Yemen have been accused of committing possible war crimes, to be fair. Um, but yeah, that's... Yes, just not very, very point yeah, sure. I, before I actually took this call, I agreed a statement condemning the British government for basically business as usual, as far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, even though the, the High Court has said what it has said. Uh, and actually on that note, does anyone have any um, final closing remarks they want to make um, because we are within our sort of last few minutes, seconds really. Anyone would like to make a closing remark? Just to say thank you. Sorry mate. <laughs> I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah, yeah. Thank thank you so much. Yeah, for chairing and thank you for, for all the questions and uh, the engagement with the talks and I hope there will be another opportunity to continue these discussions. And yeah, thank you so much to the panelists. Yeah, of course, please. Yeah. Say thank you very much indeed. I've learned a heck of a lot. So thank you very <laughs> much indeed. Fantastic. Thank you so much to all the uh, panelists who have covered so many different and varied subjects. Um, and I hope that's given people a clearer understanding of what might be happening um, in the region in the future. Um, and thank you, of course, um, uh, for our hosts as well. So uh, take care and stay safe and keep, keep well and healthy in these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, Foreign Policy Centre.